So now we want to start talking about flow with energy transport. So far we've done follow problems such as the following. We have a fluid which might be say force with some velocity coming at a solid object. We want to calculate the streamlines and the flow around this object. So in principle at least we want to calculate the velocity field at every point in the fluid which is a function of x, y, z, and time. And at least we've seen in principle, we know the formulation for doing this. And in order to do it, we needed two conservation laws, conservation of mass and momentum. Now we might want to consider problems such as the following. So now say we have a hot object, hot solid object, immersed in a cold fluid. That hot object is going to heat up the fluid which is in contact with it. That fluid is in turn going to be lighter and want to tend to rise or float up in the fluid. So now we might have an object which we have flow around, which is due to the coupling of the transport of momentum and mass and uh, heat or energy. And so to do problems such as the following, not only do we need to consider simultaneously the conservation of mass and momentum, we also have to consider conservation of energy. And so now our problems get even more complicated because not only do we want to be able to calculate the velocity field, we want to be able to calculate the temperature also at every point in x, y, z, and time. So we have to consider the coupling of conservation of mass, momentum, and energy. So, so far we've only done, talked about this coupling, and we've talked about conservation of energy, but in isolation, so in a static medium, so in a fluid which is not moving. And so to calculate these coupled problems, there's a few things that we need. One is we need to understand the concept uh, of energy a little more deeply. Uh, that was addressed in the previous video, so that we've sort of done. The other is that we have to discuss a little bit about thermodynamics. Subject of thermodynamics is a whole class in itself. Uh, this video is just going to be a few facts to get by. So the first concept we need is that of an equation of state. So let's imagine I have a piston in a cylinder and it's filled with some fluid. In this case let's consider it to be a gas. This thing has volume. I can put some amount of substance in there. So some I could put in some number of moles and it has some volume. And um, I can also externally control the temperature. And let's imagine our piston cylinder is a thin wall, so whatever temperature I hold this, if I at least wait long enough, the fluid will also achieve that same temperature. So if I have this configuration where I immerse this in a temperature bath so that my piston and cylinder becomes the temperature of the environment, I fix the amount of substance in the object, uh, and I fix the volume, so I lock this cylinder in place, then I no longer have control of the pressure. Now imagine I could also do the other experiment where I now unlock this thing and I let this piston float around and say I not only control the temperature externally but I control the pressure externally. So now I'm controlling the temperature and the pressure. Again I have a fixed amount of substance in here. Now when I do that I can't control the volume. And so you can see by this little simple example that temperature, pressure, and volume are all sort of related to each other. They're not independent. I can't control them all independently. And in the case where this is a substance which we call an ideal gas, uh, air is uh, very approximately an ideal gas at sort of room temperature and pressure, there's a familiar law that relates these things, which is what we'd call an equation of state. And it's a law you've probably already heard before, which is PV, so pressure times volume, equals NRT. And so we see by this simple relationship, uh, which is the ideal gas law, PV equals nRT, pressure, volume, and temperature are all related to each other when we have a fixed amount of substance. So if we fix any two of those variables, the other one is determined. And while we have an, act, an exact equation for an ideal gas, all substances have, will have a similar form. So the law may be different, but it still has the same fact that pressure, volume, and temperature are all related related so we can't independently control all of them. We have some equation which has to do with the molecular makeup of the material that relates these variables. Now normally in uh, fluids problems we talk more not so much about volume but we talk about density and density is nothing more than the mass per unit volume so we can rewrite the ideal gas law in terms of density which is P equals rho RT where in this case here I was careful and wrote R bar which is the universal gas constant, which is 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. Here, this would be the gas constant for the substance, which would be uh, on a per unit mass basis. In this case, we're using density, which is what we've used uh, 
predominantly throughout this course. But again, we have pressure, density, and temperature all being interrelated. So if we fix any two of the variables, the equation of state always fixes uh, the other one. So now we're going to discuss conservation of energy. So this is a law that we've discussed a little bit in previous videos, but now we're going to be a bit more precise. I'm going to write the law, which cannot be proved but only stated, which is the change in something that we call the internal energy uh, is equal to the heat in minus the work out. So the first thing we should discuss is that the sign here on heat in and work out are a little bit arbitrary, but they're uh, come back to the subject of thermodynamics uh, often being rooted in uh, the discussion of heat engines. And so if you imagine something like your automobile, the heat coming in is what powers the engine, which is from burning of the gas. So heat comes in, and what you get out of it is work. Now, of course, this is an arbitrary sign uh, choice. We could, have dis the, uh, we could have flipped this around, and in fact, some textbooks you'll find that, but this is the most common convention, heat in, uh, work out. Now, we use the variable E in this course to mean the internal energy. And this is something when we talked about conduction, we, what we talked about as being sort of the thermal energy of an object. Uh, in many textbooks, you'll find U is used. In our course, since we often use U for velocity, uh, we'll use E for the internal energy. And the other symbol we use is small e, by which we mean the internal energy per unit mass. When we talk about the total amount of internal energy, we'll use E. And when you talk about the internal energy per unit mass, we'll use uh, lowercase. Now, let's talk about this work term a little bit. And let's go back to our trusty uh, simple example of a piston in a cylinder. So here, we'll have a gas which we can compress. We'll put it in a cylinder. And let me draw this in sort of poor drawing here in three dimensions. But this is going to have some cross-sectional area A and the volume of this container will be V, and the pressure inside will be P. Now, if we talked about the work to essentially uh, push on this, right, externally I can apply some force, so I can push on this and I can compress the gas or I can let it expand, and if I wanted to calculate the work it took to compress that gas, I would do F dx, and I would integrate. So I take the force the, times the displacement and I would integrate that thing. Now, if I think about the piston here in our device, when I apply a force, that equals the pressure on the inside times the area. So I have the pressure times the area equaling the force. And if I think about as I take the area times dx, so my displacement in this direction, that really can be replaced as PDV. So uh, we'll, we'll often see this expression, we talk about work, we'll talk about PDV work, so the amount of work that it takes to compress the substance itself. And you can kind of see that this works by just doing sort of a simple example. Let's imagine we take our piston in our cylinder and we fully insulate it. And so if we write out the first law for inside this, uh, the gas inside here, we would say that the change in the internal energy of the gas inside this cylinder is equal to heat in minus the work out. Now the heat in is zero because it's insulated, so no heat crosses the boundary. And the work is just gonna come up from here, so it's gonna be minus PDV. So it's gonna say the internal energy is gonna change as minus the integral of PDV. Now the pressure is always a positive number, so when uh, dv increases so when the volume when i expand it the minus sign means the energy decreases when dv decreases the energy increases and this should be familiar with the concept that if we compress a gas we can heat it up and if we expand it we cool it down so the work we said is going to be the integral of pdv so let's start with some configuration of my piston cylinder device. I'll call it state one, a particular pressure and a particular volume. And by some magic, I'm gonna compress this, uh, my substance down, so I'm gonna have a smaller volume, which means that logically I'm probably gonna have a higher pressure. And so now I'm gonna make a little plot, P on this axis, V on the X axis. So my state one, I have a large volume and a low pressure. State two, I have a smaller volume and a higher pressure. And 
in getting from this point to this point, I followed some path. So let's say it looked like that. Now my PDV work is just going to be the area under the curve. Now, of course, I could get from this point to this point by doing something different. So I could follow a weird path that looks like that. And now PDV would be, again, the area under this curve, this other strange curve. So we see that the work is what we call a path-dependent quantity. And so when we talk about changes in thermodynamics, we usually have to be a little bit precise of whether we mean something's path-dependent or not. So we'll use this kind of delta D notation for things that are path dependent, changes which are path dependent, and a normal D for changes that are not path dependent. So normally thermodynamic quantities are not path dependent. So the pressure is uh, the pressure at state two, regardless of how we got there. The work is path dependent because the path that we take to go from state one to state two uh, depends upon how we get there. And so if we write the first law of thermodynamics in differential form, uh, we get something kind of interesting, which is we get the change in the internal energy, which turns out to be a non-path dependent quantity, so a thermodynamic property, is the difference of these two path dependent things, so the heat and the work, both which depend upon the path. So we have these inexact differentials, these path dependent things, the difference of them being something which is a property. It doesn't matter how we get there for the energy. And we can write the first law in this sort of uh, form uh, for the total amount of energy or the total amount of energy per unit mass. So here everything would be per unit mass, internal energy per unit mass, heat and work per unit mass of substance. Now the other interesting thing we can do here is that um, we had that the work, if we write that in differential form, we know that the work ends up being uh, PDV so the incremental change in the work is minus PDV, or if we do it on a per unit mass basis, we have P little dV. Now this gets confusing because now we're using little v for something which we've often used uh, earlier in the course to mean velocity. And here, little v is something funny. Little v is one over the density, or it's something we call the specific volume. So it's the volume per unit mass. So we can use this, uh, these expressions here to give us a little bit of insight into what we've talked about before being the specific heats. So let's write the first law on a per unit mass basis. So we have the change in the internal energy is dq minus pdv, where again this is the specific volume. Um, and now let's use this idea that the energy is a thermodynamic property. And so what we talked about with the equation of state is that there are uh, two things that we can control, such as temperature and pressure, and then the other one, such as density, is a given. So that ends up holding true for all thermodynamic properties. So all thermodynamic properties are things that have these exact differentials can be written as a function of any two other thermodynamic variables. So here, again, I'm going to use little v, which is the specific volume. So likewise, I, if, if I wanted to, I could say the internal energy is a function of temperature and pressure, or I could pick any two thermodynamic properties that I want. But here, I'm going to use temperature and specific volume. You might remember from calculus that if you have a function of two variables and I want to write the change in that variable, what I have to do is take partial derivatives with respect to each variable, holding the other one constant. So I have the derivative with respect to t and the partial der derivative with respect to v, holding respectively volume constant while I to look at the change in the temperature direction and temperature constant when I look at the change in terms of volume. Now, if I simply uh, look at these two expressions here, I see DE, so there's maybe some connection to it. But now let's consider a particular process. Let's consider a constant volume process. If I consider a constant volume process, for constant volume, dV is zero. So for a constant volume process, my change in my energy is just going to be the partial derivative of E with respect to T, holding the volume constant. And now if I look at my first law for a constant volume process, again, dV is equal to zero, dE is equal to dQ. So now let me equate the two dEs. And I'll get an expression that looks like this. I'll get the partial derivative of my internal energy function with respect to temperature 
holding the volume constant is equal to dq over dt. And so all this is getting at is this concept of dq over dt is something that we called previously the specific heat. So we talked about if, if I added energy to an object, ha, uh, how much the temperature would increase. Yeah, so this leads us to the concept of the specific heat, which is the incremental change in the heat added to the object per unit temperature. But you see I have to be a little bit careful or precise about what I'm taking a derivative respect to in my thermodynamic functions here holding volume constant. So the process matters is really the point of all this is that when we talk about specific heats, the process matters. And so here, this definition of holding the constant volume is what we would call constant volume specific heat, or C sub V, which thermodynamically we would equate to the derivative with respect to temperature, the partial derivative of E with respect to T, holding the volume constant is what we'll call the constant volume specific heat. When we're a little more precise with our thermodynamics, we have two specific heats. We have constant volume and constant pressure. And the, the trick is, is they're not always the same. For an ideal gas, we have a simple relationship, which is if I take the difference between the constant pressure and the constant volume specific heats, I get R, or the universal gas constant, which is kind of cool. For a liquid, which is uh, nearly incompressible, CP and CV are nearly the same. And so there we can be a little bit sloppy and just talk about the specific heat, which is what we did before when we talked about heat conduction. But now that we're getting into conservation of energy and fluids, we have to be a little bit more precise when we talk about our specific heats. And we have to be very precise in whether we're talking about the constant volume specific heat or the constant pressure specific heat. So let me give you a quick summary of some of the highlights. Things like temperature, pressure, specific volume, or density, uh, and internal energy are things that we call thermodynamic properties. They only depend upon the current state, not upon how you got there. And you set any two of them, and all the others follow. We, we also talked about the first law of thermodynamics being that the change in energy equals the heat in minus the work out. Uh, this is not a law that we can prove, but one that is proved to be true uh, by every experiment ever, ever done by every person who's ever looked at it. Uh, so it's as true as best we know, but it's not something we can derive. It's only something we can state. And uh, pr previously in this course, when we talked about conduction, we were talking about stationary media where there was no work being done. So we only talked about energy being related to heat. Uh, but now we're going to expand it and we're going to add this kind of new term in. And previously we talked a lot about the concept of specific heat. Uh, now we've seen there's actually two specific heats that depend upon the process. There's C sub P and C sub V. There's the constant pressure and the constant volume specific heat. And in some of our later discussion we'll see that we have to be a little bit precise in uh, picking which one we matter. This is a heck of a lot more to thermodynamics than I'm covering here. I'm just uh, pointing out a few things that will be useful for us later in our discussion.